My guest this week is a musician turned tech entrepreneur and a Londoner who's made his home in Japan. His business, Blaircast, aims to make equally dramatic changes in the music industry. He says it will, quote, empower artists and content creators to own and monetize their data through simple and elegant solutions that harness the power of Bitcoin. He is Shem Booth Spain. You're listening to Coin Geek Conversations with Charles Miller. So Shem, thank you very much for doing this interview. I think you've just come back from Japan to your native London, and you're here to talk about Blaircast. For those who don't know, give me a quick thumbnail of what Blaircast is. So Blaircast is a, a Web3 based music distribution platform um, that enables artists to be able to release their content and also it serves uh, labels as well. We'll go into that in a bit of detail in a minute, but I'd just like to ask you about your background, which is in London as a musician. Done a range of different music, guitar, piano, singer, songwriter, producing songs, um, learned guitar at an early age, around 13, and always loved creating music, different kinds of music from traditional rock and roll all the way to electronic uh, music, lots of kind of uh, projects around London, um, very much kind of independent musician unsigned. So I understand the, the kind of challenges that musicians would have in the context of self-distribution. And for me, that I think there's a big link between the use case of blockchain for music and arts. And I think that's been scratched only the tip when it comes to blockchain applications in the, the arts. So, so when you first heard about blockchain, which was quite a long time ago, I think, wasn't it? 2014, I heard about BTC, and I actually, when we released an album in a band that I was in called Singing Pictures, we inscribed a message onto the BTC blockchain. And I remember paying £2.50 to some developer. I said, oh, can you scribe this message? You know, the Singing Pictures release our new album, www.singingpictures.com. And I, I, I was starting to think at that point already about the storage of data on the blockchain, and that was BTC where we can only put a teeny tiny amount of data on chain. Fast forward to 2019, the restoration of BS, uh, the original Bitcoin protocol on Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. I remember it was 2019 that we did the community operation data blast, which was where we was historically putting different types of data on the BSV blockchain. So I think that's actually a very interesting story of how now we understand Bitcoin in a lot bigger viewpoint than just inscribing little bits of information. You know, ordinals is a, a craze at the moment. But I mean, so your focus was as a musician, but it's a big switch to then devote yourself to creating an app, Blaircast, on the blockchain. I mean, was that yeah. a difficult decision to make? No, no, because I, I, my passion is, I, I've always loved technology, I've, I, you know, be it, um, it I've always thought of arts as media, visual media, audio media, kinesthetic media, virtual reality environments, synesthesia, which is the mixing of the modalities of the senses, right? But I also see how technology can empower creative content and creators, yeah? And, and for me, Bitcoin is a medium. And, and, uh, you know, and our understanding is growing of what we conceive Bitcoin to be able to do. Dr. Wright famously said, Bitcoin is everything, right? It could be used for anything. You know, obviously you don't want to do Bitcoin for Bitcoin's sake, you know, in a business or application, but I do think there's use cases to it, yeah? Okay, so let's get back to Blaircast. What stage have you reached with that and what's, what's it going to do? So Blaircast, we're really proud of what we're working on. We've got an incredible team and the, the supporters that we've had backing us has been absolutely incredible mind-blowing because um, you've had investment from yeah, calvin air yeah from air, air ventures and um so we we've got a ios app android app that's currently being f finalizing the bug testing we're trying to get it really watertight so that it's a really intuitive useful playable enjoyable experience so, so if the, i download that what will I be able to do with it? So you, you can listen to music, the ability for listeners to be able to pay instantly to the music they consume, which is a real innovation within the music industry because, you know, it can take between two months to two years to get paid, yeah, through the traditional DDEX music system, right? And, and 
And that can be sped up without disruption of the industry itself. Yeah. So I think there's a big misdemeanor with often crypto and blockchain, particularly from the crypto legacy era of where people say, oh, we're going to disrupt everything. We're, we're going to, you know, that's, that's going to go. You know, I think that's a bit aggressive. You know, I think there's a middle way. So you can, can run in parallel with it. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, Bitcoin is a technology of empowerment. And Bitcoin, just as you don't know what the protocol running behind your email, we've both got email accounts, right? I, I didn't check my protocol this morning on my email. Did you, Charles? Yeah. Uh, probably not. But what we did do is we wanted something useful to communicate to our colleagues, friends, loved ones, yeah, and... Look at the the simplicity and and uh, economic unlocking that that simply email was done. But, but how are you going to get the music onto your onto Blair Cast? How will you persuade musicians to to take part? I, I think there's, there's 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 two ways. But I think what's more important is why. Why do musicians? What do musicians and rights holders need? They need fast payment, honest payment, true payment and secure payment. Those are the things that, and, and that affects positively the big rights holders from the famous names and the heroes that we all know, all the way to the budding independent musicians that are passionate and are looking to get their, their music out but there. To get big names, will you approach record companies or? Absolutely, we've got quite a dynamic strategy um, that's, that our team are engaging in. So, and. I think the, the key thing is, is the message that people are going out to potential partners in this industry. People don't want to know about the technology. The technology is boring. It's about why. Why is this technology useful? Why is it important to a prospective partner or client? How is it going to help them? What's the applicability of it? So they can see the benefits so of it. the music industry won't see this as a threat, you think? I think they... I, it's, it's very difficult, difficult to pin it down because this is a dynamic, huge market that is, is you know, has gone through several titanic situations from piracy where no one was getting paid. Napster. And yeah, the Napster era. Then we got Spotify era. And Spotify did a good job because they're Web2 and they provided, you know, if it weren't for them, it probably would be a very different history where we are right now. And now we've got these emergent technologies of Web3 that are, or Web 2.5, however you want to judge it, where we peer to peer payments, NFTs, music fungible tokens, the ability to be, to, to have new revenue models that unlock from the data of the music industry. There's so many business use cases, but it's going to take time for the, for the percolation of business ideas from startups to actually make transformational on the ground change because it's such a massive industry that's monolithic, you know. But if I download the Blaircast app mm -hmm. and I want to listen to some music, will I be making a micro payment on BSV to, yeah. to hear it? And so, so, so therefore, will I need to have acquired a BSV wallet and some put some money in it and, <coughs> and that sort now of this thing? Now, is, this is, that's a really interesting question you're saying there. And I think this is one of the things that is a reoccurrent theme in many Bitcoin BSV startups. Are we using Bitcoin as the fundamental uh, money of the platform, or are we not? How does those two effects? Mm. You know, it, is Mister and is you know someone's Ma and Pa going to use Bitcoin in their app? And what do you what do you say? What do I say? I I, I think there's different UCAT use cases. I think for the cons the average consumer um, are used to digital wallets. If you look at Asia and China and the proliferation of uh, digital uh, monetary-based fiat wallets, everyone's using them. So mm. PayPay, um, Alaba, you know, all those kind of companies, right? So people are used to digital payments, but I just think that the, the crypto 12 seed words or the, that kind of thing, I think it's very problematic as a consumer entry point because it's, it's technological debt. Yeah, so, so how will the Blaircast user negotiate the, that then? Well, I, I, believe, I believe in a world where, and this is just my personal opinion, but I think multiple tokens, multiple currencies, any fiat currency, so that whatever the consumer wants to pay, there's a seamless choice to do that. Right, so if I wanted to pay in, in the UK in, in pounds. Yeah, pound, GBP, if you wanted to pay in yen, if you wanted to pay in, uh, I don't know, Moon token. So I'd need to put some. <laughs> I'd need to put some of my local currency into a wallet and then 
transfer that for Blair cost? Yeah. Yeah, so Blaircast uses uh, traditional on-ramps and off-ramps as well as multi, multi-fiat, multi multi-crypto. And I think that's the key because then you're catering for any different kind of audience from around the world. Well, you've been involved in this world, as you said, for quite a few years now. Um, let's just broaden this out a bit. What, what do you, where do you think we've got to in, in the evolution of well, for, first of all, particular. the incredible people in the BSV space and humbling to learn and listen all the time. And for me to watch uh, this ecosystem grow to a professional, you know, we're in this beautiful four story. Right. So we're just for the people who don't know, we're, we're recording this at the London Blockchain Conference. Um, in a huge venue. Exactly. Yeah, a huge yeah. venue. And and that progression of, of and seeing startups, people with ideas and people with that camaraderie of uh, of helping one another, of trying to get pe- other people's success is a shared success. And I, I think what's really inspiring for me is, is the visionary leaders out there, the visionary people that do it every day. And I kind of look at them and think, oh, you know, I like their opinion. That's a good way I of mean, looking at it. I don't want to right? pour cold water on your enthusiasm, yeah. but we have had conferences like this for the last certainly five years when I've been involved. And there's always been this sort of enthusiasm and they've, they've got bigger and more confident each time. But somehow that kind of breakthrough moment hasn't quite occurred. Would yeah, you say? I... I I, I agree with your, your sentiment there. I think I think what everyone's waiting for is the unicorn to break the dam right. down. Exactly. And and I think there was a great comment by a chap. I think it was Joshua Hensley. He did, did a video and he was talking about where's the product. You know, everyone's everyone's trying to make great products, and what we need are great tangible, physical products that that get into people's hands that are not just for crypto people or Bitcoin people that unlock use cases. And I think. You know, it's it's a race where, you know, the, the daily challenges of of building a project from inception to to fruition is an incredible. You know, it's never a straight line, right? No. <laughs> so, but I mean, you... so all of this is happening across the ecosystem. Yeah. So I I think you, you got to put it in perspective and be like, well, you know, we're we're reinventing the internet here. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but I mean, you, you're you're an example of somebody who's an entrepreneur who's mm getting investment for your idea, you're developing it. But I mean, how long can you go on before you start seeing some income and some sales from your well, enterprise? Well, that, that, that is the ultimate goal of any business project is to generate revenue and to generate a stable income for the business. And, and I think that's where it comes back to the key point, which is product. You know, if you've got a great product and you're, you know, there's meticulously overkill on developing a product, but it's making sure you've got a product that works. But what do you, what do you say to your investors? Don't worry, we'll be have sales of half a million next year or what? <laughs> don't, don't think anyone should be saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just good. in general terms, I mean, is there sales income on the horizon in any way? Well, um, well no, because we're not launched yet. But, no, but I but, mean, you've got a, a plan. Absolutely. I, I think if anyone didn't have a plan, there'd be cause for concern. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, our objective is to build a stable business that's going to income artists and reach people all around the world, you know. And what we're trying to build here isn't just a, a small little platform. You know, we're talking Kubernetes clusters, horizontal scaling, half a million users, day one, iOS, Android app. We're talking about trying to develop uh, an ecosystem that's modular, that allows the plugging in and, and taking apart of different BSV platforms within the overall ecosystem itself. So we're trying to build something that's got longevity. And I think that we've got that. And I, I think a modular approach to building an application is probably a, a better approach than just building a singular concept in the platform, in the DNA of the platform, and then you're stuck. Whereas if you've got a modular uh, configuration of the platform, you're able to plug in the best technologies as they emerge. So is it a bit annoying when somebody like me comes along and says, well, it's never I annoying, say- Charles. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, investors must be impatient. Uh, I mean, I think this is a sort of regular thing with startups that the, that the founder sort of just has to say, hang on, we're almost there. We want to yeah. do it right. And we want to we want to not launch before I we're think, ready and all that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, I think every every founder, you know, I hope so, you know, from what, what I see is you, you want to you 
create something that works and you, you want to give back to the people that believed in you and to be able to have, you know, you, you said, what, what would you do if, if, it, if it did work? I think I'd be doing this forever. You know, I'm not going to give up, you know. No. And, uh, and I don't think, I think that mental tenacity to keep going through thick and thin is, is, is part of the exhilarating experience and uh, growth growth experience, you know? That's what you've got to have. As Absolutely. But let's just talk a little bit about Japan because you mentioned that, I mean, I know you, you live in Japan. Um, what's the, the BSV scene there? And, and what, what's the sort of cultural difference perhaps between what I'm familiar with in the UK or perhaps in the mm. United States? Japan is a very interesting place that I, th I believe that is ripe for blockchain um adoption the, the the problem seems to have been is because of the crypto speculative bubbles it's very damaged the notion of blockchain and bitcoin sv the original protocol yeah so i think that japan uh, japanese uh, from my little i understand from my experiences and if i humbly sh should suggest uh, just as anyone i think would be uh, watching someone else you know, implement blockchain, did it work for them? Oh, that's worked for them, we're gonna try it, yeah? Uh, no one wants to go out on a limb and try something that's too risky, or and especially with crypto having such a bad taste and l left that bitter sweet pill. I, I think that, you know, many businesses and Japanese business people that I've met, they've tended to be like, you know, oh, it's a, uh, show me when it works. Show me right. the steam train. So you think the environment's actually harder in Japan? I, than, I, than... I would say, and uh, I think it's a little meta metaphorical dam that once a few businesses start using it and showing, you remember that the Japanese took took a train and then recreated a mile train track and then they, they, they absolutely put it all over the country. So when they see a technology that works, and they can see the speed of the, the they're, they're gonna completely- It's just a bullet train. Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of when the train, were, there was a guy that, that took a train over there in the 1800s and oh, okay. they basically yeah. took it apart and rebuilt it. And right. they, they basically reverse engineered the technology and they run some of the best trains in the world now. So it, Japan is, is missing out and we're missing out on Japan. Uh, the expertise of Japanese engineering in regards to blockchain and its application in business technology and science. And I, I think that once some of the universities out there get to grips with the technology, get understand it, see it go with its speed, I think they're, they're going to be straight on it and understand, hang on a minute, this is the pedigree pinnacle of blockchain technology on planet Earth. We've got some ideas of our own how we can use this technology, yeah? And I think that that's going to be the security that comes from knowing others who have utilized it. Oh, there's that business over there. They've been using it for X, Y, Z. That looks great. That looks safe. That, that's nothing to do with crypto. But there are quite a few BSV people based in based There is in some Japan, geniuses think, over there. And, and, and it's conglomerating and coagulating together now. So do you is, meet up as a group? Or yeah, there's, that a, there's a few little meetings. I mean, it's starting to get a bit more. And I think that it's going to be like a bit of a snowball that it gets going. And, and, and yeah, is it, and they're, they're all OGs anyway, the, the, those Japan BSVers. They're the OGs as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Can I have your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> but, and do you work with... Japanese people as well as immigrants like yourself? Uh, not really, not really. But I do, I do know a load of Japanese people and musicians and artists and their music in industry is really interesting and different and uh, very colorful people. Yeah, what's the- Experts, what's... experts. That's all, I've got only great things, you know, to say. You know, every country has its ups and downs, its problems, you know, we're all human beings. I'm, yeah. I'm very interested in the Japanese engineering in, in, and masterfulness mindset with things and their approach to doing things. Yeah, yeah what have, what's been your experience of the Japanese music scene? Oh, uh, colorful, uh, vibrant. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about the commercial scene and J-pop, uh, if, if we were talking about the exhilarating multi-subcultures genres, you know, we, we, we had Guns N' Roses and uh, Def Leppard and Bon Jovi in the 80s and 90s, right? They, they've had this resurgent subculture emerge called hair metal. 
And it's just like all those bands have, uh, have been recreated. And that's just one tiny, the, the CD sales in Japan are going up. Oh, really? Yeah, because they've mastered the art of the product for the fan. You know, you open your CD up, you've got the golden ticket, mm. you've got the fan club. Do you want to go to a CD sign-in that's around the road? You know, here's your ticket for that too, you know. And, and they've mastered this kind of 360 fan. It's incredible. Well, and Blaircast will take that to the next level. Then. Well, we, we, we want to help. We want to help artists. We want to show the Japanese music industry as well as other music industries. And buddy music, what about the un, unmusicked? We say the unbanked. <laughs> what about right. the unmusicked? <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, Shem, thank you so much. I really look forward to uh, downloading my Blaircast app as soon as I can. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Shem Booth Spain. Next week, we'll be discussing legal matters with Marcin Zarakowski, an executive committee member at the Bitcoin Association. So please join Marcin and me next week. But until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Hey everybody, I'm Kurt Walker Jr. Join us live on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where you can ask me questions, comments, blessings, cursing, scrapes, gripes, or gropes. You can catch us live across CoinGeeks, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and probably a whole bunch of other places too. I think the big thing here, the big innovation, is the Ordinal's numbering system. So utility is driven by this whole idea of springboarding us in terms of innovation by using micropayments and unlocking all these different new ways of doing things. Decentralization, the meme, as people think of it, I don't think exists at all, anywhere. Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin wallet, blockchain, stable coins, Metanet, the evolution of money. Everybody is talking about Bitcoin today, but what exactly is it? Learn the basics from experts. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Blockchain 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.